Um, as far as our Bible reading, we're in this section right over here under the wreath between the window and the, uh, and the doorpost. If you weren't here last week, that means nothing to you. But uh, that's that section of the kings and the two kingdoms, and both kingdoms are headed for disaster. In fact, the northern kingdom has already been uh, taken away in exile. The Assyrian kingdom came in and besieged Samaria and, and, um, and took them off. So we've been reading about that and we've been reading about the, the, the unrest and the plots and the disasters that have been predicted. With what's going on in the world today, and as we turn on the TV, as we look at the news on whatever that source is, uh, it's been, on one hand, very timely. On the other hand, kind of weird to open the scriptures and read prophet after prophet after prophet say disaster is coming. Amen. It's been it's been on the one hand um, sort of unsettling, but on the other hand. Isn't it great to know that when things are happening in the world, God is not surprised. And the reason he tells us what's coming is because he wants us to know he's in control. He's not surprised. He will, so when it happens, we can say, well, God is in control. He told us this was going to happen. And, and that's what's been going on in the life of his people Israel. Prophet after prophet has said disaster is coming. It's coming because of sin. It's because the warnings have not been heeded, because the, there's not been a turning away from wickedness, particularly the wickedness of idol worship and those uh, idol temples. And the, and the way they worshiped was to practice sexual immorality and child sacrifice. And one of the things that we heard in two different, the mouths of two different prophets last week was that when you worship worthless idols, you become worthless. And that's, that's what they, that's what had happened to this culture. The culture had lost its worth because they had given themselves to idols. Last week we introduced Isaiah who was prophesying in the south and we touched on Amos and Noah who were prophesying up north. And they all three were giving the same message. Judgment is coming. And so today I wanted to look briefly at three more, but I'm going to edit myself. Can I get an amen? <laughs> but edit myself. I wanted to, to briefly touch on Micah and then the story of Hezekiah and the story of Hosea. Um, I'm going to edit real quick. I'm going to touch on Micah just for a couple of minutes. The, the Micah's prophecies um, and Isaiah's prophecies mirror each other. In fact, some of the, the words in Micah are the exact same words that you... In Micah chapter 4, they're, they're the first three, four verses are the exact same three verses as Isaiah chapter 2. And maybe you're saying, well, why is that? How could that be? One was up north, one was down south. Uh, they were in different times. Why would they say the exact same words? Well, because the same spirit was putting the words in their mouth. Now, there may have been one of them prophesied before the other and it was written down and the one had access to it. It may have been a song that was sung. It may have been a, a poem that they learned. But but these words about the coming of the Lord and we see that that principle in Micah that we see in these other uh, prophecies as well. This principle of seeing this part of history and seeing that part of history at the same time. It's like, it's like when you go to Colorado and you get just about to, uh, Lyman. You get about 30 miles on the other side of Lyman. So what do you start to see? Mountain peaks. And you see the mountain peaks and it kind of looks like a picket fence, but you can't see that some of them are many, many miles behind the other ones. They just all look the same to you. If you're looking from a far distance, you can just see the mountain peaks and, and it looks the same. Well, they, the prophets are doing that. And as they begin to prophesy, they see something near and something far and they, they can't see the distance between the two. But oftentimes, uh, there'll, there'll be some clues that are thrown in. So I'm just going to throw those clues out to you so that I'm happy. When you read the words in that day, in that day, in that day is always a reference to the day of the Lord. 
And sometimes they'll talk about coming judgment and they're talking about the coming Assyrians or the coming Babylonians. And in the very next verse, in the very next sentence, they're talking about coming judgment that's in that day. But when they begin to talk about the Lord himself appearing and the Lord himself delivering and the Lord himself forgiving and the Lord himself crushing the enemies, we're talking about that final deliverance. So there's impending judgment and then there was going to be impending restoration, which was the coming back after the exile. And then there's distant judgment and distant restoration that's going to come when the millennial kingdom is established. So look for that. You said, you're saying to yourself, I thought you were going to edit. The one piece of Micah that I do want to draw your attention to is it in the book of Micah. It's in chapter 5 where he says Bethlehem. He says, out of you, Bethlehem, I think it's about verse 2 or 3 in chapter 5, out of you, Bethlehem, will come that Redeemer. And remember, we've been talking about how this narrowing has come. It's been a, a, a child, a, 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 a seed of the woman, so that's the human race, and then Abraham, and then Judah, and then David. And now we even get a little geography. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. That, that was the scripture that King Herod's advisors told him when the wise men came. You know that Christmas story? And they said, well, where's, the, where's this king going to be born? And they said, well, let's look it up. They went to Micah and said, Bethlehem. So that's where that came from. And then I want to talk about the story of Hezekiah. Now, Hezekiah is not a book. That's always a good uh, Bible trivia question. Where is the book of Hezekiah? There is no book of Hezekiah. There's a story about Hezekiah, and he shows up in two books. He shows up in the book of Isaiah, and he shows up in the book of Second Kings. And I'm going to, if you want to turn to 2 Kings, uh, about 18, 19, I'm going to just summarize some of that. And then I want to, to hit the punchline. 2 Kings. Hezekiah came to the throne at the time that the last king was up north. Hoshea was king up north. So at the time that uh, Israel, the northern kingdom, was about to go into exile. Hezekiah comes to the throne. He was 25 years old when he began to reign. His wife's name, by the way, was Hephzibah. And Hephzibah is kind of a cool name. Hephzibah is kind of the uh, female equivalent. Remember when I did Walk Like Jedediah? Remember that sermon where Jedediah means loved by God? Hepzibah means she is beautiful and my delight is in her. Isn't it, wouldn't that be a cool name to have, gals? Well, maybe not Hepzibah. But she's beautiful and my delight is in her. And, and it was actually a personification. Both of those names are a personification for God's feeling about his people and his race and his land. My delight is in her. She's beautiful. My delight is in her. I love him. That's how God felt about it. And so if I can push pause here a minute, I'm going to jump ahead to Hosea. If you, if you get anything out of Hosea, get this. Get the Lord's heart, his feeling. That, that when Israel is unfaithful to the Lord, it's the same feeling that Hosea had when his wife was unfaithful to him. When he loved her and he wooed her and he blessed her and he provided for her and he protected her and all she could do was run around on him. That's God's heart for his people. And so Hezekiah comes to power. His wife, Hephzibah, is there with him. And it says in his fourth year, this is 18.9, in his fourth year, Shalemazar, the king of Assyria, marched against Samaria up north and laid siege to it. At the end of three years, the Assyrians took it. So from Hezekiah's fourth year to his seventh year up north in the northern kingdom, it was being overrun by the Assyrians. Hezekiah's down south. He's, he's seeing, he's hearing what's happening to the, the ten tribes of God's covenant people are being overrun. They're being deported. They're being exiled. Can you imagine the three years of that siege in Samaria? What that would have looked like over three years. Think about somebody coming in and putting a, a, a giant wall, because this is a siege, uh, where nobody could go in and nobody could come out. If they put a giant wall around the town where you live for the next three years, what would happen as the food supply dwindled, as the water supply dwindled, as everything got to nothing 
That's what was happening in Samaria. In the seventh year, the northern kingdom falls. Ten years after it began, verse 13 says, in the 14th year, Sennacherib had now become the king of Assyria. He attacks the southern kingdom. And he captures all the fortified cities except Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the, the, the Alamo. It's the last holdout. And he knows he's seen it. So he, he, he says, let's pay him off. And so he sends him a bunch of money from the treasury. But eventually, Sennacherib says, no, you can't pay me enough. I'm going to come and I'm going to take Jerusalem. And so they come down and they surround Jerusalem and they, they call the king out. And you saw that little scene there where they have this. Uh, and I don't know if Hezekiah was still on the wall or if he had gone out to meet the, the, the envoy that had come from Sennacherib. But this message is delivered. We're going to take your city. We're going to overrun you. It's over for you. And don't think that God is going to save you. Because God can't save you. Look at all these other uh, nations we have overrun. And they had gods and they worshiped their gods. And their gods could not save them. Your God cannot save you. Uh, you just, you just see that little exchange there? And he says, don't talk so loud and let's talk in the other language because the guys on the wall are listening. And the other guy said, uh, the guy from, from Assyria said, well, they're going to be in the same boat that you are. They might as well hear it. And so Hezekiah goes back and he talks to Isaiah about it. And Isaiah gives him a, a prophecy. He says, it's not going to happen that way. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, 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 a communication is going to come to Sennacherib and he's going to, he's going to withdraw for a while. And that did take place. But eventually Sennacherib came back. This time he sends a letter. He sends a letter that says the same thing, only a little bit sterner. And, and this is chapter 19, uh, verse 10. Say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, don't let the God you depend on deceive you when he says, Jerusalem will not be handed over to the king of Assyria. Surely you have heard what I have done to all the nations. Their gods didn't say them. So what did Hezekiah do? He took the letter in his hands. I love this. He took the letter in his hands and he says he went to the temple of God. And he spread it out on the altar. And he lifted up his hands to the Lord. He said, Lord, you see this? You, you see what he's written here? You see, you see what I'm facing? You see this delineation, this, this explanation of what they're going to do? And they're, they're saying this about you. They're saying you can't save us. They're saying you won't save us. Lord, help me. I can't fix it, but I'm going to lay it in front of you. And the Lord sends an answer to the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah comes to him and says, Hezekiah, the Lord has heard your prayer. Look at verse 20. Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent a message. This is chapter 19, verse 20. This is what the Lord says. The God of Israel says, I have heard your prayer concerning Sennacherib, king of Assyria. And this is the word of the Lord that he has spoken against him. He says, Either the daughters of Jerusalem or Jerusalem is like a daughter. But either way, it's like a little girl making fun of you because you're going to run away. Your messengers, verse 23, you heaped insults upon the Lord. This is what they you have said. Now, listen to what he said. I have ascended. I have cut down. I have reached. I have dug. I have dried up. Sennacherib says, I have done all these things. I've conquered all these peoples. Look at what I have done. Who's that sound like? Sound like the devil, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound like Satan? I will lift my throne higher than the most high. But sounds like some other people we know too these days, right? And what does God say? Verse 25. Have you not heard? Long ago, I ordained it. I planned it. In other words, Sennacherib, you think you have done all this, but let me tell you, you couldn't have done anything. I'm the one who allowed you to do these things. I'm using you right now. And I'm going to bring you low. 
I'm going to put a hook in your nose. I'm going to put a bit in your mouth. I'll turn you around. Verse 35. That night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian army. One moment in an instant. God takes care of the problem and delivers them. When God was using Assyria to punish Israel, it's not as though God had decided to bless the wicked. He was using the wicked, but there was a day of judgment in store for the wicked. And so when Hezekiah takes the letter to the the temple and, and lays it out and says, God, let me just lay it out here. I want you to read this. Look at this. Look at what he said. Look at what he said. Lord, I, there's nothing I can do about this. You know what's happening right now in the, in the life of Israel? God is getting them to a place where they do have nothing to rely on except for Him. Nothing. Do you know what God is doing right now in our day? Two things. He's getting the church, and maybe for the first time in history, the American church into a place where we have nothing to rely on except for Him. And whatever He brings, eventually, this is, this is what's going to happen. Eventually, He is going to get Israel to the place where they have nobody to rely on except for Him. Because there's that one last thing that God's got to do. There's that one last hard time that God's going to take them through so He can bring them in. Hezekiah lays it out and God delivers her. He delivers Israel. He delivers Jerusalem because of humility and because of prayer. And I don't know, but what maybe America isn't at a Hezekiah season right now. Possibly. Possibly judgment is at the door. Possibly if we would humble ourselves and pray, that judgment could be forestalled. I'll tell you where America is. America is either at a Hezekiah point or America is at a Manasseh point. Manasseh is the next king that's going to come to Judah. We aren't there in your reading yet, but it's going to come in chapter 21 of 2 Kings. And Manasseh is Hezekiah's son. And Manasseh does more evil than any of the kings before him. Manasseh installed, he, he, he rebuilds all the, the idolatrous temples that his dad tore down. He even takes an Asherah pole and he puts it into the temple. It says he even sacrificed his own son in the fire. In other words, he sacrificed his own infant son to the god Molech. Manasseh did. It said because of Manasseh, the, the kingdom of Judah became more evil than even the Canaanite kingdoms that Joshua drove out. Think about that. Would God be just if he allowed that to go on without bringing judgment? No. So I believe it with the, as a nation, America is, is at a Hezekiah point. The armies of Sennacherib are around us. And God may yet deliver us. Or we've, we've, we're already at this Manasseh point where we become as evil as the nations that we have defeated. But either way, you know what we're going to do? We're going to trust the Lord. We're going to trust the Lord. And so what I want us to do as we close out the service today, I'm going to invite you to join me in doing what Hezekiah did. If you were to make a list, if you were to delineate what the enemy has been speaking to you to intimidate you and make you afraid, I want you to think about those things. And it may be personal things. It may be things in your family. I'm I'm going to get your kids, your grandkids. It may be financial things. I'm going to ruin this. I'm going to destroy that. 
It may be national things. I'm bringing riots. I'm bringing political unrest. I'm bringing racial unrest. I'm bringing what are the, what are those things that are, are that are in the letter that the enemy has written us? I want us to take that letter this morning, and I want us to lay it on the altar. And I want us to spread out our hands. And I want us to say, oh, Lord, look at this. You see this? I can't fix it. I can't fix it. I've run out of every other thing to trust in other than you. But I am going to stand on this rock and I am going to anchor into it and I am going to trust you. Would you stand with me? The Bible says Hezekiah went into the temple. Now, this building isn't the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. Do you not know that you yourselves are the temple? This is the temple of the Lord. But as the church gathers together, we are also collectively the temple of the Lord. We are living stones being built together into a spiritual household. So in, in a lot of ways, because we're gathered together as the church this morning, we are, we've come into the temple. So we're in the right spot. And I want you to bow your head. And I want you to hold out the palms of your hand. And I want you to, to give those things to the Lord that the enemy has written to you in your letter. That he's been intimidating you with and scaring you with. And saying, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to destroy your family. And I'm going to destroy and kill and steal. All those things that he's been saying to you. Let's just take a minute. You list them out before the Lord. You see this, Lord? You see what the devil has written us? We love our country. We love our families. You see these threats, Lord? We lay them before you. And now, oh Lord, would you hear? Would you hear an answer? We can't fix it. And you've told us, Lord, not to worry about anything, but to pray about everything. And so that's what we do right now, Lord. It's true. It's true. Bad things are happening. We see it. We know it. We feel it in our heart. It's coming. But Lord, we look to you. And now, Lord, fill us with the strength of your Holy Spirit. Fill us with faith to extinguish every fiery dart of the evil one. Lord, all these threats... You have defeated the enemy. You have given us power over all the power of the enemy. And so, Lord, we stand on the rock right now. May we come back, like, like, like we said to our seniors, and we gave them those, those bracelets, that we, to come back to this point where we laid it out in front of you and know that you are God.